morning, church family and friends, and welcome to March 7th virtual worship experience at Church Street Cumberland Presbyterian Church. Today also is the third Sunday in Lent. We will now have a moment of women's history presented by Sister Monica Brooks. Good morning, and welcome to Women's History Month. Women's History Month started as a celebration in Santa Rosa, California. The Education Task Force of the Sonoma County Commission on the Status of Women planned and executed a Women's History Week celebration in 1978. Presentations were given at local schools where hundreds of students participated in a real women's essay contest. A parade was also held in downtown Santa Rosa to celebrate. Although the Declaration of Independence specifies that all men and women are created equal, its publication sowed the seeds for the women's suffrage movement in the United States. The original movement took root at an 1840 conference in London when two determined women met for the very first time. Even though they were delegates to the world's anti-slavery, uh, Congress, Lucretia Mott and Elizabeth Cady Stanton could not participate in the, convention, in the convention because they were women. This rejection inspired them to work together to guarantee the rights for women. Women gained their original right to vote in 1920 with the passage of the 19th Amendment. On election day in 1920, many of American women exercised this right for the first time. For almost a hundred years, women and men had been fighting for women's suffrage. They made speeches, signs, petitions, marched in parades, and argued over and over again that women, like men, deserve all the right and responsibility of citizenship. Some of the leaders of this campaign were Susan B. Anthony. In 1853, Anthony began to campaign for the expansion of marriage women's property rights. In 1856, she joined the American Anti-Slavery Slavery Society, delivering abolitionist lectures across New York State. Though Anthony was dedicated to the abolitionist cause and genuinely believed that African American men and women deserved the right to vote, after the Civil War ended, she refused to support any suffrage amendments to the Constitution unless they granted the franchise to women as well. Alice Paul was another one. She was, the leader of, she was the leader of the most militant wing of the women's suffrage movement. Paul was well educated. She earned an undergraduate degree in biology from Swarthmore College and a PhD in sociology from the University of Pennsylvania and determined to win the vote by any means necessary. Elizabeth Cady Stanton was also an abolitionist human rights activist and one of the first leaders of the women's rights movement. She came from a privileged background and decided early in life to fight for equal rights for women. Stanton worked closely with Anthony. She was reported the brains behind the strength for, the, for over 50 years to win the women's right to vote. Still, her activism was not without controversy. Stanton, on the fringe of women's suffrage movement later in life, though her efforts helped bring out the eventual passage of the 19th Amendment, which gave all citizens the right to vote. Stanton was the first president of the National American Women's Suffrage Association, and Anthony was the second. Lucy Stone also um, was a part of this movement, raised in, the, in, a, in a congregational church and embraced her father's anti-slavery zeal. Stone was frustrated by the inequality that encouraged attending college while discouraging women to become educated. At age 16, she worked as a teacher, saving her money so she could attend college. In 1839, she spent a semester at Mount Holyoke, but was forced to return home due to a sister's illness. Then in 1843, she attended Oberlin College in Ohio, in, Ohio, in Ohio. Even progressive Oberlin, however, did not permit Stone to explore her interest in public speaking. When she graduated in 1847, she declined the honor 
of writing a commencement speech that would be read by a man. A leading suffrage and abolitionist, Lucy Stone dedicated her life to battling inequality at all fronts. She was the first Massachusetts woman to earn a college degree. Last but not least, Ida B. Wells, born into slavery during the civil rights, was a prominent journalist, activist, and researcher in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. In her lifetime, she battled sexism, racism, and violence. As a skilled writer, Wells also used her skills as a journalist to shed light on the conditions of African Americans throughout the South. Her parents instilled into her the importance of education. She enrolled at Russ College. She was expelled when she started a dispute, enrolled, um, excuse me, she was expelled when she, when she started a dispute with the university's president. Wells traveled internationally, shedding light on lynching to foreign audi audiences. Abroad, she openly confronted white women in the suffrage movement who ignored lynching because of her stance, she was often ridiculed and ostracized by women's suffrage organizations in the United States. Nevertheless, Wells remained active in the women's rights movement. She was a founder of the National Association of the Colored Women's Club, which was created to address issuing, issues dealing with civil rights and women's suffrage. Although she was a Niagara Falls for the funding of the National um, Association for the advancement of colored people, her name is not mentioned as an official founder. The five mentioned women were the beginning of the reason women now have the right to vote. They did not always agree with each other, but each was committed to the franchisement of all American women. The reminder, the remainder of this month for each Sunday, you will hear about many incredible women who, con who contribute to women having the right to vote and have an equal rights as men. Thank you. Thank you, Elder Brooks, for giving us all the information of what we're to look for forward to in the coming Sundays. It is now time for our call to worship. Our help is in the name of the Lord who made heaven and earth. Oh, come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our maker, for he is our God, and we are the people in his pasture and the sheep of his hand. Our scripture reading this morning comes from John, the second chapter, 13 through 25th verses, and our scripture reading comes from the New International Version. When it was almost time for the Jewish Passover, Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple courts, he found people selling cattle, sheep, and doves, and others sitting around the tables exchanging money. So he made a whip out of cord and drove all from the temple courts, both sheep and cattle. He scattered the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. To those who sold doves, he said, get these out of here. Stop turning my father's house into a market. His disciples remembered that it is written Zeal for your house will consume me. The Jews then responded to him, What sign can you show us to prove your authority to do all this? Jesus answered them, Destroy this temple and I will raise it again in three days. They replied, it has taken 46 years to build this temple, and you're going to raise it in three days? But the temple he spoke of was his body. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples recalled what he had said. Then they believed the scripture and the words that Jesus had spoken. Now, while he was in Jerusalem at the Passover festival, 
Many people saw the signs he was performing and believed in his name. But Jesus would not entrust himself to them, for he knew all people. He did not need any testimony about mankind, for he knew what was in each person. You've heard the reading of the Holy Spirit. We pray that you will put it in your heart and use it daily. It's prayer time. Have you ever been afraid to do something that was very important? But you know, we've heard the term about being prayed up. And before doing this deed that I did, I felt like I was prayed up not only by myself, but by all the people that knew I was about to go on this adventure. And this adventure was me leaving Huntsville, Alabama, going to Tampa Bay, Florida, to a very important event. Well, I was afraid to go, but I knew I had to go. And so I, after I left Huntsville and went to Atlanta and from Atlanta to Tampa Bay, and got in a cab and went to the, air, uh, to the hotel and got to see all of my immediate family members there, I was still afraid. And so the next day I went to a wedding, the wedding of my oldest grandson. I was so happy and so proud but I was still afraid. But you know, God gave me the courage. He gave me everything that I needed to go through this. And I began to relax because you know, God is with you in everything that you do. And I am so thankful that he was with me and that I was able to come back to Huntsville, Alabama and go take the COVID test again and I was negative and everyone in my family proved to be negative. I praise the Lord for allowing me to be there to witness my son, my grandson getting married. So we go to prayer this morning. We go to prayer because we're so thankful because God is so good. Not just today, not just yesterday. God is good all the time. And so when we go to prayer, we open our hearts up, we open our minds up to receive what God has to say. Father, we thank you for giving us another day, and we pray that we use it to your glory. We pray that all the many blessings and, and, and things that you've given us and things that you've put in our eyesight for us to witness that you are our God and that you will stand by us and you will hold us up and you will keep us in your presence. And there are so many things, dear God, that, that are out of our control, but we depend on you for you to tell us what to do and how to do it. We ask you, dear God, that in, in our thankfulness and in our praising you, that you show us what we're missing in our life, what we need to do for others. Dear God, we, we are an open vessel to do whatever you will have us to do. Because, God, you have been so good to us. Show us how to take care of your people. You have protected us from COVID-19. You have placed a protective shield around us. Not only me, dear God, but my family, our children, our grandchildren, and all of these people who are in your care and under the sound of my voice, we are truly thankful. You have made a way when we couldn't see a way, dear God, and we thank you. You've turned bad news into what we could tolerate. Dear God, we thank you because we know prayer changes things. Thank you, dear God. We cannot thank you enough for all the things that you've done for us. We thank you for the new leadership of this country because, dear God, many prayers have been answered. 
We thank you for the vaccinations that have been received and those who are waiting to get their vaccination. Father, we thank you. We thank you for the members of our church that work behind the scenes. We thank you for all the helpful hands, the AV group, the choir members that come here and sing praises to your name. We thank you for the church staff, the cleaning crew, security. We thank you for the deacons who work and make things work in this church. We thank you for their willingness. Father, we thank you for the leadership of this church. We pray that you will continue to bless him and give him the strength that he needs to lead your flock. We thank you for the work of the session of this church and the board of trustees, dear God. Their work goes, a lot of work goes on behind the scene, but we thank you for the wisdom that they, that they have to do your work. We pray for those who are sick and shut in, those who just don't feel well, those who are lonely, those who are bereaved, dear God. We ask that you give them your grace and mercy. Father, we thank you for everything. We thank you for the thoughts that we've shared. We think of, thank you for the thoughts that we cannot express because we know that you sent your son, Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior, and we are so thankful. And in his name, we pray, we make this prayer, amen.
Chancel Choir for the beautiful music this morning and thank you for singing that particular song that I just wanted to hear today. That song is certainly a prayer for all of us that God would order our steps each and every day of our lives so that we might be in the right place at the right time among those whom he has preordained that we might have influence in their lives. Thank you, Elder Brandon, for your spirited leadership this morning, the anointing of God upon your life. Thank you for sharing with us this morning in leading this service. Thank you, Elder Brooks, for sharing the moment in women's history. We are looking forward to having that moment each Sunday morning this month as we celebrate the contributions and the legacies of women throughout this land and beyond. We greet you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ, and we are so delighted that you have joined us again on this Sunday morning. We are certainly thankful for our audiovisual team for the ministry that they provide each and every week of uh, each and every week. Uh, thank our wellness team here that checks us in on Sunday morning to make sure that we are all right. Uh, thank you, uh, Mother Porter and Sister Liz Jolly for that. Amen. I want to invite your attention beginning today and for these next Sundays of Lent uh, to Luke chapter 4, verses 18 through 19. And we will look at a part of verse 18 today, but let me read these verses in their entirety. 
the spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Let us pray. Gracious God, our Father, we thank you for the privilege to join together in worship for those of us who are in this sanctuary as well as those who are in the sanctuaries of their homes. We thank you for uniting us together this morning that we might offer our worship and praise to you. We love you and thank you for your patience your long suffering, your forgiveness of our sins. Now God, as we look at your word today, grant unto this your servant uh, the anointing of your Holy Spirit. Grant wisdom to say and preach that which you have called upon for this day. It is in the name of Jesus we pray, amen. I want to talk with us this morning from the subject anointed to fulfill God's mission. Anointed to fulfill God's mission. Just as God sent Jesus into this world to intervene for and in the lives of all the people of the world, now, so in turn, Jesus sends us who are part of his family to go where he sends us and under his perfecting power to minister to those who are in and around us. Now, even though Jesus was a master teacher and certainly a heavenly sent healer, Jesus also always expressed a divine passion for working to achieve God's vision for justice in this world. And so here we are today in today's textual focus, Luke chapter four, verses 18 and 19. And herein is recorded Jesus announcing his purpose, his mission, his vision as he reads from the words of the prophet Isaiah. It is here in Jesus' inaugural message on that day when he stood to read the scripture during the worship service, just as Elder Brandon stood to read today, that Jesus selected a passage from the Old Testament prophet Isaiah. Using that scripture, Jesus announces his mission focused on encouragement to the downtrodden, pardon for the prisoners, justice for those who have been wrongly treated, compassion for the disadvantaged. All of these that are part of his mission to the world derives out of a heart of love from God directed toward every single individual. There's none left out, there's none left behind, there's none left aside, even though they may be in this society. God has been busy working through Jesus, including those who otherwise have sometimes been overlooked. Those who were most vulnerable in the world, God sent Jesus to intervene and to stand with those who sometimes have been tossed aside. What Jesus announced on that day was the calling of God on his life. What Jesus has now announced was the heavenly calling and commission that would direct and order his footsteps, that would direct his daily lifestyle wherever he was. For wherever Jesus was, these words that Jesus read from the prophet Isaiah would be a part of his banner. Whether he was in a private home or a mass public meeting, whether he was talking to the 12 or to a multitude, 
whether he was speaking to family and friends or whether he was addressing his public enemies and foes. For Jesus, his focus was always centered on bringing the kingdom of God changes into the world. Jesus was fully committed to his mission, doing what God his father had sent him to do. And so daily Jesus proved through his words and through his works that God's will was his will, that God's will was his will. And so as it was with Jesus in his life and ministry, we should also pray thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Let me suggest to us this morning that we all take an inventory of our lives and ask, is what I'm doing about me or is it to uplift and glorify God? Let me ask us this morning, have we completely sold out to knowing and doing the will of God and being a part of the great godly mission to this world? Are we sold out to fulfill the call of God on our lives regardless of what others may say or do or think? Are you sold out this morning to fulfill the mission that God has given to you? There's a hymn that speaks to this concern when it says, you have longed for a sweet peace and for faith to increase and have earnestly, fervently prayed. But you cannot have rest or be perfectly blessed until all on the altar is laid. Is your all on the altar of sacrifice laid? Your heart does the spirit control. You can only be blessed and have peace and sweet rest as you yield him your body and soul. Jesus standing up and taking that scroll and opening it up to Isaiah 61 verses 1 and 2. He read these words, the spirit of the sovereign Lord is on me because the Lord has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted to proclaim freedom for the captives and release from darkness for the prisoners to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God to comfort all who mourn. On that day, Jesus announced the very thrust of his call. Notice, my brothers and sisters, what empowers, what motivates, what anchors Jesus' ministry. You get the clue from the very opening words of what Jesus read. The spirit, the pneuma, the breath of God, the life-giving breath of God, the power-resourcing life of God. The spirit of God is on me. The spirit is on me. You remember when Jesus was baptizing, John was baptizing Jesus in the River Jordan Luke 3, 21, the second part of that verse in 22 captures this moment as he, Jesus, was praying, heaven was open and the Holy Spirit descended on him in the bodily form like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, you are my son whom I love with whom I am well pleased. Just picture this scene here at the Jordan God the Father speaks from heaven to confirm his only begotten son who is Jesus who is now being baptized in accordance with the prophecy. And the Holy Spirit shows up and descends upon him in the bodily form of a dove and anoints Jesus, sanctioning him to embark on that which was his mission. Can't you see it today? All three persons of the Holy Trinity gathered, the whole Godhead gathered and on one accord in support of the mission that Jesus is embarking upon. Luke testifies in the book of Acts chapter 10 of this very thing where he writes, you know what has happened throughout the province of Judea, beginning in Galilee after the baptism that John preached. 
how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power and how he went about doing good and healing all who were under the power of the devil because God was with him, the anointing. God was with him. And just as the Holy Spirit was with Jesus, as Jesus commenced that earthly ministry at the age of 30 years old, so the Holy Spirit is with us who are part of the family of God. The Holy Spirit anoints us and confirms us and reassures us. Whatever part of the body of Christ which we are individually with our corresponding function and responsibility. It is the Holy Spirit who calls us and positions us in his body with the spiritual gifts that we have, with the ministries to which we have been called, with the activities in which we have been committedly involved. It is the Holy Spirit who anoints us just as he anointed Jesus. When we get anointed, by the presence and power of the Holy Spirit, then we, like Jesus, will go about doing good just as Jesus did. When we are anointed by God, God opens doors for us. When the anointing of God is on our lives, just as it was with Jesus, the anointing will make things happen that we could never make happen or see happen on our own accord. My brothers and sisters, we can't fake being anointed. When we're anointed, it's the power, the powerful presence of God working in us and through us and even beyond us and sometimes even in spite of us. It's the Holy Spirit who gives us what we have and it's the Holy Spirit who works with us. It's the Holy Spirit who manifests himself through us just as he did through Jesus. And so when somebody inquires of you, why are you serving, they may ask. Why are you serving where you are? Why are you doing what you're doing? Why are you sacrificing so much and giving so much of your time? Why are you getting up and going over there to that church, sacrificing and giving and serving would you just tell them the spirit of the Lord is on me? That's what Jesus did in his announcement. The reason I do what I do is because the spirit of the Lord is upon me. I don't do it to get recognition. I don't do it to get name and fame and glory. I don't do it to get, get some kind of uh, benefit or, 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 or that it may prosper me. I do it because the spirit of the Lord is on me. When somebody asks you why, why you preach, preachers, you just tell them I do it because the spirit of the Lord is on me. You, you, Ella, Ella Brand, you named all, I think you may name all the, all the things that I'm getting ready to name in your, in your prayer this morning. But when, 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 when someone asks you, my friends, this morning, why do you serve as an elder? Why do you serve as a deacon? Why do you serve as a trustee? Just say, because the spirit of the Lord is upon me. It's not just because they ask me to do it. It's not just because I wanted to do it. It is because the spirit of the Lord is on me. When someone asks you why you cheerfully and willingly and sacrificially and generously spend so much time doing what you're doing as a mother, a lay leader, a Sunday school or Bible study teacher, a director of music, a musician, a choir member, an usher, a hospitality and parking lot attendant why do you serve in the bereavement ministry or in the kitchen and why do you serve in, in working with children and youth as a church administrator or custodian whatever your position of service may be in the church say to them I don't serve just because there was an election held and I got the most votes 
I don't serve just so that I might get my name on a certificate or on a plaque. I don't serve just so my name can be mentioned. I serve where I serve because the spirit of the Lord is on me. That's why we keep reaching out in the community, trying to make a difference because the spirit of the Lord is on me. When you think about how he has spared us, forgave us, called us to repentance out of the sinful life of the world, when you think about how God has saved a wretch like us in to serve in this present age, that's why I serve. That's why I do what I do because I know there's a charge laid upon me to serve this present age. My calling to fulfill. Tell them I'm not doing what I'm doing to just please somebody. I'm doing what I'm doing to please God. Bottom line, the spirit of the Lord is upon me. I I wonder, I know I can't hear all of you out there, but those of you in this sanctuary, can you just affirm why you do what you do and just say, the spirit of the Lord is on me. He, the Holy Spirit, works with us, us individuals, regardless of our inadequacies and regardless of our ineptness, regardless of all that we have failed in and that we should have done and said and who we should have been, God still decides to use broken, wretched vessels like you and I to be a blessing to the church and to our family and to the community. He chose us before we chose him. And he works continuously to bring us closer to him and to align our will with his will. He does that through the scriptures that we read and memorize and rehearse and meditate upon that calls and strengthens us. He does that too through the sacraments that we observe that remind us as we are baptized and as we partake of the Lord's Supper as we will this morning, that we belong to him, that we've been bought with a price. He, the Holy Spirit, speaks to us during corporate worship. He challenges us and start, continues his work of changing us, refreshing us, reviving us, re causing us to repent of our sins and then renewing our faith. Holy Spirit works with us, nudging sometimes us through the testimonies of others. It will cause us to cast aside our resistance and our rebellion and, and elaborate. sometimes our fears that we can't do what we has God has called us to do. Have you ever, has God ever spoke to you, nudged you, gave you an unction, and, and, and you really wanted to move out on it, but fear gripped your heart. And all you could see is failure in front of you. You were reluctant to try. You were reluctant to venture out and adventure, take this adventure with God. And then God send you someone that will encourage you and say just what you needed to hear that will push you on out into the deep. Holy Spirit moves, blesses us with his anointing presence. All I'm trying to get us to remember this morning is that wherever we are, whatever position, whatever office, whatever we are doing in the church, it is because the Spirit of the Lord is upon us. He has anointed us. He resides within us. He is over us. He is, he is a part of us. He's pushing us daily, nudging us 
to continue to fulfill his mission on the earth because now that Jesus has returned and sat down at the right hand of his father in glory, you and I, the members of the body of Christ, are his voices, we are his hands, we are his feet. And he lives his anointing life through us to continue to make a difference in the world. The spirit of the Lord, Jesus said, is upon me. Sometimes we think about the spirit being on us. We think about it making us move and emoting an expression and visual and verbal expression of shouting. Sometimes dancing in the spirit or clapping our hands or stomping our feet. And sometimes when the spirit of the Lord is upon us, he'll make us cry when nobody's bothering us. But more than that, when the spirit of the Lord is upon us, he will call us and cause us to live in such a way that our faith is made alive in the midst of the, those around us. That's what Jesus meant when he said the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me. He has consecrated me. He has furnished me. He has supplied me with the necessary powers to do the work of the ministry. He has touched us. I want to ask you this morning, have, can, can you be a witness that God himself, the, through the power of his spirit, has touched you. Because Robert Richardson's title of his book is The Power of the Touch. I wonder this morning, can you say that he has touched you and he has made you whole? The spirit calls us, consecrates us, furnishes us, endues us, imparts spiritual gifts to us. We can't do what we are doing of ourselves. We would falter and fail if we just tried to depend on our flesh. But when we depend upon the anointing of the spirit of God, the supernatural anointing of the spirit of God, we're able to do what we could not otherwise do. Charles Spurgeon said, without the spirit of God, we can do nothing. We are as ships without the wind, branches without sap, and coals without fire. We're useless without the spirit of God. We need him. We need what the spirit of God provides. We need that anointing that he provides to us. We need that divine enablement of God's ability imparted to us. God's anointing takes us beyond our human and natural ability. When the spirit of God is upon us, then it, 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 it just causes a difference to be made. Matter of fact, it's like what the senior folk used to say, you can tell when the spirit of God is on someone because it runs from heart to heart What's in that heart goes and touches another heart. And God, it all comes from God's heart. God's heart through one's heart to another's heart. That's what happened this morning as we were listening to the singing of the chancel choir. You couldn't help but, but, but be touched by the fiery presence of the Spirit of God. As the song was sung, you could not be helped but touch when Ella Brandon led us into worship this morning through the reading of the word and the praying of the prayer. What was in her heart touched our heart because it came from the heart of God. That's what the anointing is all about. I close this morning by just telling you when the anointing of the Holy Spirit is on you, He'll make room for you, Deacon Smith. You, you don't have to wrestle and jostle and tussle with folk to get in position. When, when the Spirit of God is on you, he'll, he'll move you up in line. And nobody can deprive or deny you what God has for you because what God has for you, it is for you. When the anointing is upon you, 
You don't have to worry about elevating yourself. You humble yourself before him and he will exalt you in due season. When the anointing is on your life, doors will open that you didn't even know was there. Opportunities will overtake you. It'll, they'll run, outrun you and catch up with you and be a blessing upon your life. When the anointing of the Spirit of God is on you, you'll get invitations that you didn't even ask for or seek after. You'll get positions that you never thought about, never campaigned for. When the Spirit of the Lord is upon you, when he anoints you, God will work through you and beyond your gift. When the anointing is upon you, people's lives will be touched through your life as God works through you, in you. When the anointing is upon you, that anointing through the gifts that he has given you will help to break satanic strongholds. It will cause yokes to be broken. Fear will be overcome. When the Spirit of God is poured upon you, God will even make your enemies be at peace with you. Your enemies who have declared war against you will wind up blessing you instead of cursing you. They'll wind up helping you when they wanted to hurt you. When the Spirit of God has been poured upon you, you would experience that anointing that David wrote about in Psalm 133, it is like the precious oil poured on the head, running down on the beard, running down on Aaron's beard, down the collar of his robe. It is as if the dew of Hermon were falling on Mount Zion, for there the Lord bestows his blessing, even life forevermore. When the Spirit of the Lord is on you, as those verses declare, your whole life will be blessed. Stories told little boy who was flying a kite. It's a windy day. The kite kept going higher and higher. And finally, the kite got so high that it was out of sight. A man passed by and saw the little boy holding on to a string. The man couldn't see the kite, so he asked the boy, how do you even know you have a kite up there? The boy replied, because every now and then, I can feel it. I end the day by saying, you, you may not see it all the time. You may not experience it in every moment. Sometimes you may go through a dry season. Sometimes it may be bland in your life. But every now and then, there's a tug. full of saying this song. There are some things I may not know. There are some places I can't go, but I'm sure of this one thing. What is it, y'all? That God is, come on, say it, y'all, that God is real for I can feel him deep down within. Yes, there's a whole lot of stuff. I, I sometimes sit and I watch these game shows, Ella Brandon, and I, I try to try to answer the questions, and there's so much stuff that I don't know. Deacon Smith, Sister Liz, my mother Porter, I, I don't know that, but there's one thing I know, that God is real, for I can feel him deep down inside. Doors of the church are open. The invitation to discipleship is extended. If there's anyone who's listening this morning, who have not accepted Jesus Christ, maybe you have not responded in obedience to the call of God to salvation. Or maybe you've just wandered away from the church and you've been away doing what you have been doing for a season, but you're ready to rededicate your life. I asked you today to see the email on the screen Connect to Church Streets, churchstcpca.org. Let us know that you've made a decision to accept Jesus. If you have, if you would just confess your sins, believe that you can't save yourself. You can't ever be good enough to save yourself. You can never do enough, be enough to save yourself. 
But if you will accept what Jesus did on the cross by faith and ask him to come into your life, forgive you of your sins, the word says you shall be saved. And so I ask you this morning to pray that prayer and ask God to forgive you and to save you as he brings you into his family. We're going to have the choir to sing a song and then we will do our virtual communion. time of celebrating the sacrament of Holy Communion. We remember the words of scripture on the night in which Jesus was betrayed. He took bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it, gave it to the disciples and said, this is my body, which is given for you. Take it, eat this in remembrance of them. After they had supped, he took the cup when he had blessed it, he gave it to them and said, this is the cup of the new covenant in my blood shed unto the remission of your sins. Drink all of this in remembrance of me. Let us prepare now to partake as we pray. God of grace and mercy, we thank you for the forgiveness of all of our sins. We thank you for washing us, cleaning us from every single thing that we have committed or omitted in our lives. Thank you for your patience and grace, your long suffering and mercy, your tender kindness demonstrated through the giving of your only begotten son, Jesus the Christ. And we thank you, God, that he gave his life so that we might be saved. We ask, O oh God, now that you sanctify these elements of bread and cup, set them apart from their common use to that of a spiritual one, that as we eat and drink, we may remember the perfect sacrifice of Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name, amen. This is the bread, which represents the body of Christ, Take and eat this in remembrance of him. This is the cup of the new covenant of the shed blood of Jesus Christ. Take it and drink it in remembrance of him. Jesus said, as often as ye eat and drink, 
of this bread and cup, you do show his death and suffering until he returns. Again, I want to thank Ella Brandon for her leadership this morning in worship. She is our liturgist for this month, and we thank God for her. We congratulate her and her family on the grandson, Jordan, that got married uh, a few days ago, and we were glad that she was able to join them and celebrate with them. Let me ask our church family and all others who are listening, please remember Dr. Willie T. Brown in your prayers. I'm not sure whether he was released from the hospital yet or not, but he is supposed to be released. And um, so let's pray for him as he recovers. And let's pray for Deacon Mitch Oko, who is gravely ill in Huntsville Hospital. Pray for his wife, Esther, and for their children. And for her mother, who tried to join her and them this week, this past week, but for some unknown reason was turned around and was not able to come. So she is back home in Nigeria. So please pray that uh, something will be worked out so she can be here with her daughter and family. Let's pray for all of those who are sick and shut in. I think we're having a call, Deacon Smith. Uh, Deacon Smith has sent out, on behalf of the church, deacons and church, a prayer call today from 4 to 5 o'clock. If you did not get that call, get that invitation, then contact Deacon Smith, and uh, he will share that with you. It's been almost a year since we have been in this virtual environment. God has blessed us, and as Elder Brandon said earlier, he's kept us. And so we want to continue to do those things that make sense to keep ourselves safe and well. So keep wearing your mask. I know our governor has said that I think on April 10th of 9th or 10th of next month that the mask will be mask mandate will be lifted. But each of us have has to make a decision about what makes sense for safety for us. So let's do what we believe is safe for us. I pray that you have a great week this week and that you will continue to experience the presence, the wisdom and strength, the comfort and renewing power of God in your life as we continue this Lenten season. And now may the grace, mercy, and peace of God that surpass it all understanding crown us and give us strength for these days ahead. In Jesus' name, amen. And we'll listen to the choir as we close for this day. <laughs>